<laughs> okay, cool. All right, thanks everybody. Welcome back. Uh, hope you're all doing well. It's good to see you guys. Sun is out. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, so today we are starting the second part of our course. And uh, if you remember, as I told you on the first day of class, we divide this course into republicanism and then democracy and then progressivism. So we're now moving into the democratic phase and I want you, of course your, your second paper, I haven't got the first paper back, but your second paper deals with the question of, or at least one of the prompts deals with the question of democracy. So I wanna think about what is this notion of democracy and how does it fit? So we were talking earlier in the semester about the ideas of enlightenment, and we're going to follow through on that to a certain degree, because what we're going to see flourish now in the 1800s, so in the 19th century, we're going to see this flourishing of a couple of different ideas, but a couple of ways of thinking as well. So the most important thing for our class is truly this rise of democracy. And what is democracy? Where does it come from? What does it mean? How would it change the very nature of the republic to be more of a democracy than a republic? So we're gonna to need to define it. We're gonna to need to think about what it means. We're gonna to have to understand the mechanics of what it is. There's another force that's going on that starts at the very end of the 1700s, a force called Romanticism. And romanticism is equally important for us. Well, I won't say equally. Democracy is more important, but romanticism is just slightly below it. And the two things will kind of blend together. So democracy, understandably, means the will of the people. However, that works itself out, which is never easy. But how do we work out the will of the people? But the question of romanticism is a question about the very nature of the human being. How do we think about what a human person is? Romanticism, as it develops, was meant, though it never had the same intellectual firepower, but romanticism was meant to be a kind of new form of classicism, though different, obviously. Classicism is not romanticism, but it's supposed to be similar to the classicism of the Renaissance. So if you remember back to Western heritage when we talked about the Renaissance, those people in the Renaissance, we're trying very, very hard to get past the Middle Ages. They even gave us the term Middle Ages, claiming that they were now in a third stage of history. But they were in a third stage of history by going back to the ancient Greeks and kind of looking at everything in their modern world, that is the world of the 1400s and 1500s, through the eyes of the Greeks. What these guys want to do is very similar but very different. The Romantics want to view the world through the eyes of the Middle Ages now, but without the Catholicism. So they want a kind of Protestant, sanitized Middle Ages. And they're going to be a very powerful force. We see them at all kinds of different levels. In music, Beethoven is the ultimate expression of Romanticism. And the ideal, think about especially, and I should have brought this in, I didn't today, but Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, the Pastoral Symphony, it is as romantic as it gets. Romantic in the proper sense of the term. Bringing back these old pastoral themes, getting back to a simpler age, trying to figure out who and what we are. But we also see it in writing. People like Henry David Thoreau or James Fenimore Cooper, who wrote The Last of the Mohicans. These are also deeply romantic writings where they try and find God and sacramentality in nature itself. And it can be political. You can have people who would be kind of socialist romantic, like Richard Wagner later on. Uh, Nietzsche comes out of this tradition as well, but in music, especially Wagner. Uh, but you also have people who would be very seriously individualist in terms of their romanticism, like Henry David Thoreau, who's an anarchist, or someone like, gosh, who else might we have at the, the time? Well, we'll leave it at Thoreau uh, as a good answer. Well, in, in England, we would have Coleridge, and uh, yeah, that would be a great example there. But romanticism then, again, it never has the intellectual firepower that the Renaissance did, but it is a kind of new Renaissance, but now going back and taking what the Renaissance discarded and making that real. So if many of you have seen, and I'm gonna bring these paintings in, 
the, the nature of a republic and how a republic goes from kind of brilliance to decay, these are always done in a very romantic fashion. What happens? What's the soul of society? So romanticism, not necessarily as you may have celebrated on Friday with St. Valentine's Day, but romantic in the sense of observing nature as this incredible creation that deserves to be understood as a kind of sacramental longing. And now I'm kicking myself for not bringing those slides in today, but we'll, I'll try and do that on, on Monday or Wednesday. Okay, so there's one other force that we have to talk about. So we have democracy and we have romanticism. There's a third force at the beginning of the 19th century, and that force is a force of revolution. That is, what does revolution mean? Is a revolution like what the Americans experienced, where we merely overthrow a power and then reestablish right what had gone wrong? Or are we like the French, in that we want to start over at year zero and bring everything to a brand new order to undo all of the past? So remember when I made that revolution on the board, do we have a revolution that's 360 degrees like we see in America, or do we have one that's 180 degrees like we see in France? So if you don't mind in your books, and actually even if you do mind, I will assert my professorial authority. Um, I would like to turn to the, uh, page 195 in your reader. And 195 is the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen, which you can see is published on August 26th of 1789. And so the revolution begins on Bastille Day. Bastille Day is July 14th of 1789. So we're only a month and a half later after this, this popular, very violent uprising on Bastille Day. We now, a month and a half later, are willing and ready to write, or at least the French are, are willing and ready to write this Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen. And they clearly take <coughs> the Declaration of Independence <coughs> as a model, but they go in a radically different direction with it. So would someone like to read? Just start, and we're gonna go down through point number six on the next page. So, yeah, Alan, thank you. The representative, representatives of the French people organized as a national assembly, believing that the ignorance, neglect, or contempt of the rights of man are the sole causes of public calamities and of the corruption of governments, have determined to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural and alienable and sacred rights of man, in order that this declaration, being constantly before all the members of the social body, shall remind them continually of their rights and duties in order that the acts of the legislative power, as well as those of the executive power, may be compared at any moment with the ends of all political institutions, and may thus be more respected, in order that the grievances of the citizens, based hereafter upon simple and incontestable principles, shall tend to the maintenance of the Constitution and redound to the happiness of all. Therefore, the National Assembly recognizes and proclaims in the presence and under the auspices of the Supreme Being the following rights of man and of the citizen. Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may only be founded upon the general good. The aim of all political association is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. The principles of all sovereignty reside essentially in the nation. No body nor individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. Liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. Hence, the exercise of the natural rights of each man has no limits, except those which assure to the other members of the society the enjoyment of the same rights. These limits can only be determined by law. Law can only prohibit such actions as are hurtful to society. Nothing may be prevented which is not forbidden by law, and no one may be forced to do anything not provided for by law. Law is the expression of the general will. Every citizen has a right to participate personally or through his representative in its formation. It must be the same for all, whether it protects or punishes. All citizens being equal in the eyes of the law are equally eligible to all dignities and to all public positions and occupations according to their abilities and without distinction except that of their virtues and talents. All right, great job, Ellie, thank you. So here we have something that seems very similar to the Declaration, especially in the idea we see there on point number two in particular, 
The aim of all political associations is the preservation of the natural <coughs> and imprescriptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. So that language feels very comfortable to us. And it seems to be an expression of natural right. But then you get mixed in with that these really oddball, contradictory ideas that make almost no sense at all. Unless we think back to the Western heritage and we think back to the idea of enlightenment and what's going on, and I, I still don't think it's a just argument, but we can understand what the argument is. Look at point number three. The principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No body nor individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. So if this is to be the case, this means that there is absolutely nothing we can do. And if you just put this up to that bill written two years earlier, the Northwest Ordinance, these two things would explode upon impact touching one another. Remember what the Northwest Ordinance said. We had every, we have every single right to associate in any way we see fit with one another as long as there is not fraud. So Devin and I can associate, Ali and I can associate, Stephanie and I can so associate, Stephanie and Ali and Devin and I can associate. We can always do this as long as there's not fraud. We can do it for political reasons, economic reasons, religious reasons, anything, educational reasons. We want to start a college. We have the right to do all of this. The French Revolution undoes this. Their version is exactly the opposite of common law and of natural rights as understood in America. They are undoing that. So everything comes from the authority only of the whole. So if Ali and I want to form a business, the only way we can do so is with the permission of everybody in this room. It is completely the opposite of America. And this is why we have to understand the French Revolution is not an equal to the American Revolution. It is the opposite of the American Revolution. And I can't stress that enough, how utterly different these two revolutions are. One is fighting for the right of association and community. The other is fighting for what we might consider a kind of collectivist nationalism in the way that it's perceiving things. Apollo. So when they say that um, um, authority proceeds directly from the, na the nation, they mean everybody in the nation everybody. who gets put up right. to popular vote. Exactly. Everything becomes subject to the will of the people at large. So this is when we say that we believe in the sovereignty of the will of the people. It, it doesn't mean this, yeah. right? They, they're using the same words but they mean it in a radically different way. So if you guys remember when we talked about the Enlightenment, the great figure, and he's known as the insane Socrates of the French Revolution, the great figure who's hovering over all of this is the great Enlightenment figure, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Rousseau has this theory, which exactly is exactly what Apollo just asked. He has this theory that we can only understand societies as collectives not as little associations, it's just chaos for him. But And plus he thinks it's anti-individual, as I'll try and explain here. But he says the only way properly to have an individualism in which we're all equal to one another is if we all give ourselves over to the general will. And the general will, which is the language you see in article number six of what Ali just read, this idea of the general will is the collective body of who and what we are. And it doesn't mean 51% of the people. It means the people writ large. So I'm going to read to you just briefly from Rousseau to give you a sense of what he means and where these ideas of the social contract for the French come from. So obviously we as Americans draw upon a very different type of tradition. We're drawing much more on what would be linked to the Scottish tradition rather than on this French tradition. But he says, and if any of you are interested in doing papers for something else, you're going to have to do it for my class. But this is book one, chapter six of the social contract. So just if you need it later on for something or another class. I assume men, having reached the point where the obstacles that interfere with the preservation of the state of nature prevail by the resistance over the forces which each individual can muster to sustain himself in the state. 
then that primitive state can no longer subsist and humankind would perish if it did not change its way of being. So you've got to put two people together here. Hobbes, if you remember, Hobbes had argued that in a state of nature, everything is all against all. It is a war of one against another in a state of nature, and it is nasty, brutish, and short. So basically, we would all just eat one another if we were just suddenly made free. Locke, his student, says, no, that's not right. In fact, generally in a state of nature, we would all get along, but there would always be that one troublemaker. And so in this group, we might have Isaac as our troublemaker. And so what do we do? Well, we all give up just a little bit of our rights, just a minimal amount of our rights, so we can protect ourselves against Isaac. So we define our property, we define our lives. But you know, there's the troublemaker, it's, it's one guy, it's okay, it's not gonna be a problem, but we create this minimal state. Well, Rousseau wants to have both. He wants to have Hobbes and the kind of, we must collectivize completely against evil. But he also wants the individualism of Locke. Now that, that seems to Americans totally contradictory. And I say as an American, it is totally contradictory. But it was what the French were trying to bring together. Bring together the kind of radical negativity of Hobbes with that absolute utopia of Locke. So the problem, Rousseau says, is that when we have a society in which Ruthie and I can sign a contract and be completely separate from everybody, again, as long as there's no fraud, and Devin and Apollo can, we all we create these little petty tyrannies, according to Rousseau. So marriage is a form of tyranny. Businesses are a form of tyranny. They're tradition-bound, they're ruled, and that's not what we want. We don't want religion telling us what to do. We don't want professors telling us what to do. The only way we can decide what is ethical is if we, as a full body, decide what is ethical and what is not. And therefore, we each get an equal say within that body as not persons, as a person, I'm not just Brad, I am a father of seven kids, I am a professor of, over the years, thousands, I think I've calculated 1,800 students over the last 21 years. Uh, I am oh, many different things. I'm a brother, I am an uncle, I am a friend, I am a writer, all of those things. And what Rousseau wants us to do is strip all of that away and make me purely Brad, equal to every one of you. So we strip away our talents, we strip away our successes, and we become naked in the public square, everybody equal one to another. And that's how, uh, that's how Rousseau, and if this is contradictory, you've got it. Right? You've got to understand that it doesn't really make sense, but he's trying to combine Hobbes and Locke to get this. So I'll continue with what he says here. Now, since men cannot engender new forces, but only unite and direct those that exist, they are left with no other means of self-preservation than to form by aggregation, right? not by community, but by aggregation, all of us, a sum of forces that might prevail over those obstacles resistance to set them in motion by a single impotence and to make them act in concert. So we have to all work together to overcome the tyranny of the past and the tyranny of tradition, which shapes us in ways Rousseau would rather not have it shape us. The sum of forces can only arise from the cooperation of the many. But since each man's force and freedom are his primary instruments of self-preservation, how can he commit them without harming himself and without neglecting the care he owes himself? This difficulty in relation to my subject would be stated in the following terms. And this is the, the really critical part. To find a form of association that will defend and protect the person and goods of each associate with the full common force, and by means of which each, uniting with all, nevertheless obey only himself and remain as free as before. Now that should sound really wacky. You have to completely submit yourself to the tyranny, because only then will you be totally free, individually. But you can only understand this if you recognize he means be free of the past. Be free of all those traditions that you inherited from your parents and your grandparents. Be free of all that crazy stuff your priest or your rabbi taught you. Right? That, that all just holds us back. 
None of that allows us to be truly individual. Only when we've thrown off all of that bunk and started over again can we be truly free. And we can only be truly free if Hannah and I enter the arena, not as Professor Brad and student Hannah, but as individual and individual. It's the only way we can do it. So is this someone, I'm not asking you to agree, and I'd be kind of horrified if you did, but I, everybody understand what he's getting at here, this idea. Okay, I'm gonna read two more paragraphs, and then uh, hopefully that'll, we, we can move on from or so. He says, these clauses, rightly understood, all come down to just one thing, and that is the total alienation of each associate with all of his rights to the whole community. So, all of our rights we give over to the community. Right? We call them inalienable. He says we can alienate them. We can give them over. And then in the first place, since each gives himself entirely, the condition is equal for all. So again, Hannah, Ruth, Devin, and I, Stephanie, all of us, we enter into this completely free of our gifts and our past. We just come in as raw individuals. It doesn't matter that I'm 52 and she's 19. Right? It doesn't matter. Right? We, it doesn't matter that she's female and I'm male. It doesn't matter that I'm the professor and she's the student. All that matters is that we give ourselves entirely as individuals over to this community. If then, this is the last thing I'll read from yourself, if then one sets aside everything that is not of the essence of the social compact, one finds that it can be reduced to the following terms. Each of us puts his person and his full power in common under the supreme direction of the general will. And in a body, we receive each member as an individual, indivisible part of the whole. So that's his attempt to mix the collectivism of Hobbes with the individualism of Locke. And that's Rousseau. So Rousseau wants us to create this general will. So going back to what Ali read, again, look at point number three on page 196. The principle of all sovereignty resides essentially, right, its soul is in the nation. No body, no individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. So I can't be Professor Brad, I can't be Father Brad, I can't be Friend Brad, I can't be Husband Brad. I don't think I've said my name that much recently. Ah, I'm getting busy. Um, <coughs> I actually am old Disney. A little too much self-absorption. Uh, I can't be any of those things without all of you agreeing to it. So completely different from our understanding. Okay, so now, so a number of you raised your hands to, to read, and I thank you for that. I got a little overwhelmed for a second seeing everybody. So I'd like someone else to read for a moment, and I want to turn to another thinker, the man who is in every way the ultimate anti-Rousseau, but he's greater than that. He is also not just the anti-Rousseau, he is the better. John, are you volunteering? No, I have a question. Oh, about please, go ahead. So like, if you want to look at this from a like, conceptual to govern standpoint, would Rousseau essentially be maybe each individual like have the authority of the sovereign? So like in order to act, the sovereign must have like the consent of the people these will affect. Ask so that again. Person. Start start over. I'm sorry. I just didn't. No, no, it's okay. Um, so like through like the lens of consent of the governed, would Rousseau essentially hold every individual in society up to the standards of a sovereign, where they would have to act in a way that's in accordance with the consent of the government? Yes. Yes, absolutely. No, you nailed it. That's perfect. And that's why we see, yeah, that was great, John. And, and that's why I, I didn't have you guys read this, but we do have a reading in here uh, by Maximilien de Robespierre, who's one of the leaders of the French Revolution. It's on page 209. Uh, I am assigning it, but I haven't assigned it up to this point. And you can just read it quickly. We're not going to read it in class. But one of the things Pierre, Robespierre says as this leader of the French Revolution is that what we must have is an enforced morality. And this, I don't mean to sound too conspiratorial, but this is exactly what political correctness is right now. Except political correctness generally doesn't have the force of law. It has the force of peer pressure. But it doesn't have the force of law. But imagine if we could make all of political correctness law. And we would have governance of hate speech everywhere. 
not just in certain places, but everywhere. And we would always have to, we would have to be held to the standard of the community. Robespierre actually argues that that is true morality. There is no such thing as morality, say from Judaism or Christianity. That was just false, airy-fairy, sun god stuff. You know, that's a step above paganism, but nothing really more. Instead, the only real reality we know is not what our fathers taught us, but what we start over with and understand this is the way we deal with one another. And therefore, for someone like Robespierre, it is absolutely moral to kill the wrong-thinking person because that wrong-thinking person has changed the whole nature of the general will and therefore has no right to exist. It, he advocates public murder for it. That's part of what he's getting at. And, and so imagine, this is, again, we sometimes think that the French Revolution and the American Revolutions are alike, but the French Revolution guillotine, you guys know what that means, right? Where they, they drop the blade on top of the neck and split the head from the body. They guillotined 50,000 people. And anybody know how long you live after your 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 brain is cut? It's like a minute or something. You, you, it's about six seconds. Okay. But can you imagine? That means you can watch your head roll into the basket. Now, this is not a humane way of dying by any means. This is horrible. So they, this guillotine becomes the symbol of the French Revolution. Well, who are they going to guillotine? This is really amazing. Who are the victims going to be? Grace? Okay, many of the aristocrats. Yeah, but many of the aristocrats have suddenly become French revolutionaries, too. So if you do that, you're kind of safe for the most part, right? So it's being led by the intellectuals, not by the common people at all. And that's one difference. Of course, in America, we're really only a common people with only a slight aristocracy in the South at this point. So, John? I to use like a 20th century term, but you could call them like dissidents would be the ones who would get the... Yeah, the who would the dissidents be? I mean, right away, let's say that we need to start over at year zero, and they do, they start over at year zero, right, getting rid of all the Christian tradition. Our calendar is a Christian calendar, right? They rename the months, they rename the weeks, the days, they give us a 10-day week, you know, Who's going to go first? The Ruth? The priests. Absolutely, the priests and the nuns. Right? That's who you get rid of first. They're the ultimate expression of tyranny of the past. Right? They worship the sun god. Ridiculous. Kill them. And they do. And this is not going to be any different. I told you guys we'd get more and more depressing as we go on in the semester. You know, the very first thing Stalin order, or excuse me, Lenin orders in the Russian Revolution Number one, he creates the gulag, does that immediately. It's within a month of the beginning of, of the Russian Revolution. Number two, he lines up all the Eastern Orthodox priests and nuns on bridges, and he has the machine gun down to dispose more easily of their bodies. It's always, in these revolutions, it's always the religious figures who go first. Who would go after that? Nobility. Yeah, and who would the nobility be in this case? Remember, many of the nobility become Robespierre's. I mean, many of these people come. So, yeah, people like me, the professors. Right? You get rid of your intellectuals next. They're dangerous. So you go for religion and intellect. Then you kind of run out of people. Who are you going to keep killing? So, Devin. Well, at this point, then they start tur turning inward. Yes. And then start killing off all the... I guess not ideologically pure enough for absolutely which uh, I'm not sure how that ties in with I guess the if there's a constant concept or a constant evolving concept yeah. of the general will yeah. or if that is itself tied down to the past however recent it was sure. which just gets really bizarre with Rousseau already bizarre enough but. yeah yeah no absolutely so you're going to get rid of all of these people but at some point you're going to start running out of mass numbers to kill 50,000 people. That's a large number, especially given that the guillotine can only kill one at a time. You know, they have several guillotines, but still, you know, that's, it's a lot easier in the 20th century to throw 100 people into an oven than it is to kill everybody individually. So in the 20th century, we have the technology for mass killing. You really don't have that in the 18th century. Well, who do they go to next? Roughly out of that 50,000, about 40,000 are just peasants 
who got in the way of things and needed to be killed. So most of the people who die are total innocents. Right? The priests and nuns are innocent, but at least there was an excuse for killing them. They had a justification. But the peasants, well, isn't this a, a revolution for the people? And yet the people are the ones they're killing. So this revolution in France gets totally out of hand very, very quickly. Yeah. How did they get to this point, or how did Rousseau even come up with these ideas? Like, with America, it was because, like, common law, and sure. the French were kind of infringing on that. They were compelled to do it. Right. Like, what was, what injury them? Well, th this is a great question. And we see in Rousseau this idea, he takes this from Locke, but he definitely has the belief that every one of us is only what we are because of what we're born into and what we're made. So we're born into wealth, we grow up wealthy. We're born into Catholicism, we grow up Catholic. So he really is, in so many ways, trying to undo that, that past. So how do we get past the past? That's how the general will comes about. But it also means, in terms of our character, we are a blank slate, we're a tabula rasa. So we can be made whatever can be made. If you can make something, that's what we can become. So it's this idea of starting people right away, age two or three. Uh, this is in part why we have early education. It's very Rousseauian, the idea, even though I don't think the people who are doing it are saying, you know, end like this. But these are very Rousseauian notions that you take people away from their bad environment and raise them properly. We use this excuse all the time. Yeah, and we do it, and it has kind of a classy feel to it, but it's still very Rousseauian. So a lot of it just has to do with the fact he doesn't believe that there is a human nature. <coughs> there can only be made human beings in the sense of what we create them to be. So, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. Candy? If that's what they thought, why did they even mention, like, natural inalienable rights? Because it seems like they don't agree with the general premise of the American Revolution and, like, kind of have yeah. a completely different idea, but then it also seems like they're kind of like... <clears throat> trying to emulate or replicate it and like say the same kind of verbiage but not actually mean it. So like like it doesn't seem like they're trying to sugarcoat it either or like hide what the <laughs> yeah. Are. Yeah, so good like point. why why the muddiness? Yeah, I'm not that's a great question, Cameron. I'm not sure I can give you a satisfactory answer. Uh, there's no doubt that the American Revolution sets the stage for further re revolutions. Even the Soviet Revolution at some level draws upon the American Revolution. It's much more drawing on the French Revolution, but then the French Revolution is drawing on the American Revolution. So the American Revolution is a world-shattering event because it opens up the possibility of overthrow of government in ways that the world had not, the Western world, had not seen in centuries. So it is a major moment, and that's why we call it the Age of Revolutions because the Americans are the first to do it. I would just argue that if we put someone like George Washington versus Robespierre, or if we put Thomas Jefferson versus Jean-Jacques Rousseau, we have very, very different people here. But Rousseau, again, he would like to have that natural rights argument of, of Locke. He just doesn't believe we can do it because the past holds us down. But we could create inalienable rights if we do it as a community. They just don't come from God or from anything other than that. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I don't think I'm really answering you. I wish I could, actually. Um, it'd be a great article. <laughs> or it'd be a great article to try and figure that out. But I'm not qualified. I, I know the American side. I only know the French side well enough to know I don't like it. So <laughs> that's, um, yeah. How's that for the honest statement of the day? <laughs> so, Okay, good. Devin. Just kind of picking up on that for sure. the, the distinctions between the American and French Revolution. Uh, a lot of the debates going on at the time covering how horrible revolutions typically can turn out. Wouldn't the United States have essentially had somewhat of a more be a stronger benefit in that it had some established governments, obviously oh, within the colonies, and trading it more? French didn't have any of that. French have no tradition of self governance. And right. with, with that, the American Revolution being more kind of like an act of secession that didn't right. overthrow the British government, like clearly did France, just, where yeah. France, the French do all of the stuff you yeah. don't want to do. Well put, Devin. I mean, no question, the French are under tyranny, and that's a huge part of it. They don't have any history of self-governance, whereas we as America have nothing but the history of self-governance. <clears throat> so that's a huge factor in all of this. France had been self-governing in the Middle Ages, 
But with the rise of the early modern period, it had gone towards stronger and stronger monarchs like Louis XIV, the Sun King. So, yeah, and Cardinal Richelieu from the church. So there were reasons, I mean, don't get me wrong, there were reasons to dislike the Catholic Church in France and to dislike the monarchy, but it's possible to dislike those things and not end up murdering 50,000 people. Right, right, those two things don't have to go together. I dislike so, plenty of people, yes. but you know. I dislike plenty of people, too. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's, uh, I want to turn to another figure who's really the anti-French revolutionary figure, and this is Edmund Burke. And Burke gives us his response to Rousseau here on page 208, that last full paragraph. So if somebody would read this, I'd done it. Thank you. So starting with taking, taking it for granted. Taking it for granted that I do not write to the disciples of the Parisian philosophy, I may assume that the awful author of our being is the author of our place in the order of existence, and that having disposed and marshaled us by a divine tactic, not according to our will, but according to his, he has in and by that disposition virtually subjected us to act the part which belongs to the place assigned us. We have obligations to mankind at large, which are not in consequence of any special voluntary act. They arise from the relation of man to man and the relation of man to God, which relations are not matters of choice. On the contrary, the force of all the pacts which we enter into with any particular person or number of persons among mankind depends upon these prior obligations. In some cases, the subordinate relations are voluntary. In others, they are necessary. But the duties are all compulsive. When we marry, the choice is voluntary. But the duties are not matter of choice. They are dictated by the nature of the situation. Dark and inscrutable are the ways by which we come into the world. Devin, stop there for a moment. Nice job, so thank you. Uh, okay, there's so much in this. And I want you guys, this is going to be, this is a very important text for me in lots of ways, and it's very important for our class. I want you to understand Burke's argument. And so I, I want you each to be able to spend some time not only reading this from Burke, but really especially understanding this last full paragraph, of which Devin just read about half of. Um, and we're going to finish here in a moment. But I, I can't stress enough how important this is. So notice what he says. And this is a speech he's giving to Parliament, by the way. So here's Burke. And he tells us right away, you all know I am not a disciple of Rousseau, the Parisian philosophy. Right? Don't, don't even pretend or think in any possibility could Rousseau be my ally. In no way, shape, or form. And Burke can't stand Rousseau, personally as well as uh, in terms of their politics. So don't, don't even think about that. Right? And you all know that. And he's kind of being playful with his audience. Burke is the leader of the opposition within Britain against the French Revolution, and he had been. Burke writes his first book on the French Revolution, simply called Reflections on the Revolution in France. He writes that book starting immediately after he read the Declaration of the Rights of Man. He starts writing it within a month after that. And his book, we're taking this from a different book. This is from Further Reflections. It's the sequel to Reflections. Creative title, right? Reflections, further reflections. Uh, that's his. But he is already against the French Revolution because of points number three and six, which Ali read earlier. So he's already predicting how wrong this is going to go. Now, you have to keep this in mind. Edmund Burke, who is a member of Parliament, he's Irish, but he's a member of Parliament. Edmund Burke was the single greatest defender of American rights and liberties in, of anyone in Britain during the entirety of the American Revolution. Burke constantly put his own life in danger to defend American rights. He is as patriotic for us. He's as unpatriotic in Britain, but he's as patriotic for us as George Washington is. They're not the same character. They're different types of character. But Burke put his life on the line time and time again to defend us. He is truly our greatest ally. And so here we have, and this is your question earlier, here we have this guy who is giving us the ultimate defense of the American Revolution. And then immediately when the French Revolution says, oh my gosh, this is totally evil. This is horrible. Right? So people are scratching their heads. Like, wait a minute, Burke, how can you do that? You love one revolution and hate the other? It, that doesn't make any sense. In fact, to this day, you still find scholars who say Burke went crazy, that something went wrong. But 
He's being totally consistent. And this is why. Because he tells us, what do we know? The awful author, now don't use awful in the modern sense. He's using it in its, in its very positive 19th century sense, a being that fills us with awe to be at wonder at God's majesty. Right? The awful author of our being has, according to his will, subjected to us the part that we find belonging to us, the place that's assigned to us. So, Devin has absolutely no choice about his parents or when he was born. He doesn't have any choice about the religion that his parents may or may not practice. He doesn't have any choice about their ethnicity. He has no choice at all. God determined that Devin would come in this place in this time. But at the moment that Devin reaches the age of maturity, by the moment he reaches seven or eight, every choice he makes is his. And this is Burke trying to blend all of those questions of Western civilization. How predestined are we to how much free will do we have? And Burke says, let's just be obvious about it. We are totally predestined when it comes to our entrance into the world. Dark and inscrutable are the ways by which we come into the world. Not one of us gets a choice. But after that, all the choices are ours. Every choice. So when I marry, I had the right to choose my wife, and she had the equal right to choose me. But the moment we marry, the entire situation changes. Okay? I no longer have a choice in this. She's now my wife, and I've made a public oath for her to be my wife until death do us part. Nothing can break that. Nothing. So we've automatically made this alliance. We've made this commitment. And it means that the ways I treat her are now dictated by the situation. Up to the point we got married, up until two seconds before we said I do, we were different people. But the moment we got married, we had these obligations. You have obligations to your parents. You didn't get to choose those. But you do have those obligations. They brought you into the world. They gave you life. And they may have been scoundrels. They may have done other things. Or they may have been wonderful. But regardless, you owe them something. And that's what Burke is telling us. In the same way that even if I don't know you all individually, I, I, I told you all, I know Ruth very well. Uh, I've only known Isaac a short amount of time. In this classroom, I, as Brad, have the same duty to Ruth as I do to Isaac. Even though my history with Ruth goes back to the day she was born, literally. Doesn't matter. In this classroom, I have that. Now, in church, I have a different relationship with her because she's my goddaughter. Isaac is not even my godson. I don't even know what if he's religious at all. I have no idea. I know she is, and partly because I've been responsible, but it's her choice. But I have some responsibility in that being her godfather. That's what matters. Right? These are the things, these are dictated by those situations. So as students, these two are equal. But as persons, God, daughter, and not, they're not equal, depending on the circumstances. That doesn't mean we're subjective. It means that we understand contingency. We understand context. So even though Burke is writing this, and it almost sounds a little glib for a moment, there are deep elements going on. He is saying, what makes us human? What makes us human is the situation in which we are born, and then what we do with it. Right? For those of you who've read The Lord of the Rings, I mean, this whole thing is summed up with Frodo saying, yeah, I, I hate that I'm born into this time. Gandalf says, well, of course. Right? All who are born in such times do, but you get to choose what you do with it. That, that, that is the ultimate summation of this passage that we have here from Burke. It's the great Burkean moment in the Lord of the Rings. Okay, Devin, do you mind reading a little more? Yes, sir. So the instincts which give rise? <clears throat> the instincts which give rise to this mysterious process of nature are not of our making. But of our physical causes unknown to us, perhaps unknowable, arise moral relation. But cons consenting or not, they are bound to a long train of burdensome duties towards those with whom they have never made a convention of any sort. Children are not consenting to their relation, but their relation, without their actual consent, binds them to their duties, or rather it implies their consent, because the presumed consent of every rational creature is in unison 
with the predisposed order of things. <clears throat> Men come into that manner into a community with the social state of their parents, endowed with all the benefits, loaded with all the duties of their situation. If the social ties and ligaments spun out of those physical relations, which are the elements of the commonwealth, in mo most cases begin and always continue independently of our will, so without any stipulation on our par own part, we are bound by that relation called our country, <coughs> which comprehends, as it has been well said, all the charities of all, nor are we left without powerful instincts to make this duty as clear and grateful to us as it is awful and coercive. Our country is not a thing of mere physical locality. It consists in a great measure in the ancient order into which we are born. We may have the same geographical situation, but another country, as we may have the same country in another soil. The place that determines our duty to our country is a social, civil relation. Okay, this is really radical for me, Devin. This is really radical in what Burke is saying here. And notice Rousseau gives us this kind of, well, this is our general will. Everybody in this <coughs> world has to agree to work this way. Burke says, no, it doesn't work that way at all. It all starts with what we believe to be good. And if Isaac and I are neighbors and fellow countrymen, we're fellow countrymen. And it doesn't matter if I live in Michigan and he lives in California or if he lives in Canada. If we're countrymen, we're countrymen. Our country is much greater than the soil in which we find ourselves. Our country is what we believe to be good and true. This is what determines who and what we are. And Burke is giving us an extreme anti-nationalist statement here. Don't make a god of your soil. <clears throat> Don't do that. The soil is merely a gift from God, the gift of temperance. You may use it for good or for ill. But the soil is not that important. What matters is what you do on the soil, the family you create, the community you create, the church you belong to, what you consider to be necessary. That's what it, this is. And Burke is giving us a sense. So think about brought up Tolkien, think about Lewis and Narnia. Uh, Narnia is that place that binds us together regardless of where it is. And it doesn't matter if we're in this world or physically in Narnia. This is Aslan's country. Right? We belong to that in some way. That's what Burke is saying here. So our relations matter. And of course you can imagine not only is he taking on the French, but he's also defending the Americans. He just said, you can live in a different soil and either be or not be a part of our country. Right? He has just defended the American cause. They're more British than we are, even though we reside on British soil. They are more American than we are. Okay, does Burke make sense for everyone? I love Burke. I mean, I just, Burke is my modern guiding light and has been along with T.S. Eliot my whole adult life. So I'm biased, but I want you to understand Burke as well. Devin. I actually got a question more on Burke in contrast to some of the other French sure. people. There's a great, really short book by Yuval Levin uh, contrasting Burke and Thomas Paine. Yeah. Now, I don't know if Levin's kind of overstating the case a little bit, at least in contrast, but in contrast with Thomas Paine's defense of sure. the French Revolution, is Burke throwing out and disregarding the more natural rights Lockean tradition? No. Brand? No, I don't think, in fact, I think right here he's showing us a natural rights situation. Right, in many ways, but we can talk more about that. Okay. Let's let's do that at another time. Yes, so that's great. Okay, thanks everybody. So do read that Robespierre uh, very quickly. I would also like you to read uh, the few pieces that we have from Thomas Jefferson for Monday, okay? Everybody have that? All right, and I, I do hope to have your test back to you Monday. So. Robespierre and Andrew? And Jefferson. Have you heard of him? <laughs>